as you <coughs> all already know. Yeah, so basically, I, I work as a front-end developer for one year, so I'm very fresh. In fact, the previous year, around this time, I was drawing art for a game company. Uh, actually, we do like more agency work, so for eight years, that was my life, and I recently switched my career. Um, I'm not going to talk about my career switch. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is what I actually like about front-end design, which is the design part. Front-end design, actually, I think, I mean, front-end development is, to me, a very huge uh, world because like, it doesn't involve just HTML and CSS. Nowadays, it involves like, the frameworks as well, like React, and there's a lot of things to learn. But I'm not sure if anyone has seen this, but this is like um, a roadmap. If you Google uh, front-end development roadmap, it's one of the first results. And actually, design is not part of it, but I think it's a very huge part of what I do in my workplace. I was under the impression that maybe I wouldn't use design skills as much in my work, but that was wrong. In fact, there were a lot of things that I thought I knew about design that I didn't. So why bother? I mean, like for some of you, it might be like uh, back-end developers, or you may not even uh, really think that design is needed. And um, some of you might be front-end developers, and you might actually know what I'm talking about when you, uh, even if you have designs, uh, designers who are passing you off design specs, uh, sometimes you still encounter design problems. And I think like even for um, back-end developers, like it's very good to know because um, design is not just about aesthetics. I think the part about design that is actually very fascinating is like the functional part of it. Um, that's a Vox uh, video, uh, which, which is a YouTube channel, and a, that video is actually just about um, bad design dogs. Like, not just uh, dogs, I think um, in our everyday life, we, go, we can encounter like, minor inconveniences due to design. So for instance, like uh, microwave buttons, with like plenty of buttons and they all look the same. Um, and that's like one of the reasons is because like, uh, when they design microwaves, like, one of the ways that they trick you into thinking that it's more complex is by adding more buttons. Um, and not just that, like, um, there are sometimes there are designs that I think uh, actually affects society. So the way that we treat our homeless people in a lot of cities, for instance, um, we actually design benches to be empty homeless. So what this means is that we, we built it so that they can't lie down, and that's how we keep our homeless uh, invisible. Like, if you go walk around Singapore, and you go and count the benches with like, all these like, barriers, and the ones that don't have those barriers, you realize that yeah, this is how we treat our homeless people. And um, I guess like design not only is informed by society, it also informs society. So back to uh, like what does this have to do with front end thinking, uh, front end design thinking in particular? Like for me, I think um, in my work especially because I work in web development, uh, most of it like has a bit of a structure involved because it is. Uh, constrained by the web. So what does that mean? Like, actually, a lot of design principles is very much the same, whether it be it is, uh, the fact that it's on paper or it's not. Because, um, like, these are actually the steps, and then I can end this here, <laughs> but it's actually very big. So, um, with a design principle, like, what this means is like, you have a, have a system, but then you don't have a system that's so rigid that you are not flexible. And, um, Sometimes you have to think beyond the requirements, which is like uh, whatever requirements that is passed down to you by the uh, designers, for instance. So, wait up, I think I skipped quite a few. Okay, spoilers. Okay, so what do you mean by have a system? Like, um, because you can think about it as, oh, okay, I have a system, it's a logical system, I think it, it works, and like, what makes it a good system? I think um, before you go into all these details, especially if you are just a developer and you don't really know uh, what to start with, the best if you are working in the company is to ask your designers like, for the branding guide, or if you are in a company with 
uh, an established workflow, you might already have it. So like for instance, you have your variables stored in your SAS file, and you have um, the BIM like the BIM methodology of like uh, making your style sheets, which means each of the uh, CSS that you are applying is actually modular. So that's probably like uh, one of the better ways to start with. But then if you don't actually have a uh, designer or you don't have like a uh, huge project, I guess one of the easier ways is to use a CSS um, framework, which uh, I think might, you might be familiar with. So like bootstraps or material. So there are some things that are actually kind of uh, tricky when you're using those things, which I'll get into later. So wh what you start with, right, when you want to start with a design system, like one of the things is you ask yourself, where do I start from? And some people might start with colors, but actually that's something that might be wrong. Well, maybe not wrong, just like not ideal. Because if you think about it, like we can go without colors, like we can go colorblind, but we cannot go without scale. So um, always start with like the scaling. So uh, in this case, 16 pixels is like a very good number. The reason being that uh, 16 is very easily divisible. And then secondly, um, actually that's the default font for a lot of browsers. And uh, if you go, like you don't change your settings, like that's almost always like what you're familiar with. So you have the base there and you know that, oh, 16 pixels looks like this. And now you can just like scale it up, right? So, but then the thing is like, it's quite tricky because a linear scale does not work. Because um, if you think about it, oh, okay, I, I, like for me, for instance, I'm an artist, I'll think, oh, uh, I'll just scale it with the golden ratio, it sounds cool. But actually, if you scale it that way, so you just do like a 16 times like 1.16 or whatever, like the golden ratio, and then what happens is you get this. Uh, it looks quite nice, but then actually the, mo like the more helpful uh, font sizes, which are usually between like 10 to 24 pixels, there's only like three options. And you can you end up like adding a lot more font sizes to your system in the end. So what you actually have to do is like go artisanal about it, which is not precise and actually kind of like just guessworking because you handpick the pixel sizes and then um, make sure that they are like exponentially scaled, kind of um, approximately with approximately like twenty percent jump if you. Uh, between each of the font sizes. So the good thing about this is that like, once you have this system, um, you can actually very easily select your uh, other scaling, like your icon sizes, the spacing sizes and all that, because uh, you put like a few options in between. And then let's say you want to create like an uh, icon and a um, uh, button. And you look at the, those three options and you know like, immediately, like which ones look better, I hope. I mean, the correct option is the middle one. <laughs> so for colors, I think less is more. Uh, we start with a limited palette. If you look at like the, uh, let's say, material or bootstrap, that's what they kind of do. Like they already have like a um, palette that you start from and then you work your way from there. And one of the things that you might not, uh, you might do when uh, you are like selecting colors, right? And then it's like, oh, I want something that's darker than this. And then you just like handpick the color. But um, if you can, you can also use the last function for this, which basically uh, darkens or lightens the color um, like computationally. And then you can save it to a variable. And what happens is like you, when you save all of this to your variables, and then sometimes maybe um, let's say you work in a company, and then they say, uh, actually, I don't think blue is our brand color anymore. Can we switch to green? And now all you have to do, you go go in and find your variable, and then you change that. And that's like one like line of code that's like, then it's done. Oops. <laughs> okay, thanks, Taya. Present and then. It's fine. That's good. Good. Yeah. Um. Okay, somewhere here. Yes. 
So yeah, back to where I was at, which was um, so basically the variables is I think like one of the time saving things. And then um, one thing to note is that we obviously want our font size, or like font colors, to be visible. So uh, I think most of us will know. Oh, instinctively, don't put like bright yellow on a white background. But then, okay, so if you put like gray on, let's say black or white on black, like what makes it a good contrast? Actually, there is, there are guidelines for such things, and uh, it's based on accessibility. So, like for instance, uh, old people or like uh, if you are uh, have vision problems, what does those uh, contrast look like? And you can go and check out the WCAG uh, guidelines, and there's actually online contrast checkers that automatically uh, checks your contrast for you as well. So uh, I mentioned that like oh that there is a bit of like a trade-off when you use uh, frameworks like Bootstrap, is that you get into a uh, like a kind of trap where you think that. What their system is like the, the ideal one, and then you, you just like use whatever they give you, right? So what happens is like a lot of times, especially for bootstrap, uh, what you end up using all the options that they give you, and then for the uh, top, what happens is that you think okay, delete should be red, and then maybe um, if it's like a successful action, it should be green, and if it's a neutral one, maybe blue, but that kind of doesn't have any hierarchy. So for instance, if you were to give a user um, these buttons, they don't have a clue like at a glance what they are, like what's the primary button that they should actually be pushing. But I guess if you don't want them to do certain stuff, actually the good way is to make like those uh, options less uh, important. So in this case, like less is more. Um, so the ones that you want to uh, actually bring out, that's the primary button, and then the rest you can just like, make it more neutral. So the step two is be clear, but also be flexible, which is basically be water. And one of the things is like being clear is actually kind of hard to do when you are um, designing stuff and then you don't like, you don't actually know too much about the details like you, you kind of uh, skip over. So like a lot of times, even when I'm like uh, doing front end work, what happens is I think it looks fine. It looks like polished. And then I bring, I, I show it to uh, my senior developers or other people like the marketing people. And they are like, I don't get like, am, like is this supposed to be long to this part or like they are confused. So, um, Always be unambiguous, even when it comes to like very minor things like uh, the spacing. So, for instance, the top one, right? Like the header for two paragraphs is actually evenly uh, spaced between those two. It's alright if you do, there's like no like this like header does not belong to anyone. But if it's supposed to belong to the bottom paragraph, then um, make it close to each other. So all this like minor stuff actually applies like, throughout. So the, the devil is in fact in the details. So the next part which is like being flexible. Um, like I think a lot of us, if you are using let's say a framework or even if you are designing a system, we'll start with a grid. And a grid is awesome for simplifying stuff. But if you think about it, how do you design stuff that is mobile responsive on the grid if you just like, let's say, say in general, oh, okay, I just want it to pick um, five out of 12 of the grids. In the end, the mobile one will be very, very small, right? So maybe you think, okay, then never mind, I'll, uh, the desktop one, it will take five out of 12, but then maybe the mobile one, let's say, it will take 10 out of 12 of the grids. So you end up having um, the, like, all the grids like jumping around everywhere, which is not a very good user experience. What you should do instead is to just set up like a fixed width. So in this case, uh, let's say the sign up form, um, then now this is a login form. Uh, make sure that like the there's a width that's already set, and then uh, it doesn't matter if there's like white space in the desktop version because actually white space is good. 
The other thing is like the last thing is uh, thinking beyond the specs, which I actually had a lot of struggles with. Um, because like sometimes the requirements come in and then they tell you, say, oh, I want like the, the product manager might be like, I want this button in this color and, and so on and so forth. And they write like, write it, they write out all the specs and you do it. And you have a nagging feeling in your back of your mind that is not really the ideal solution. But then you are like, okay, maybe the, the product manager knows what he or she is trying to do, so you just deliver it. Um, but I've learned throughout my year four of like front end development is that like actually there's a lot of iteration involved. So uh, sometimes we have to anticipate problems, and some of the problems might be things that like if you think about it, you understand why it's important. But a lot of times, like we don't, uh, because it's like so minor. So for instance, uh, let's say you are trying to display. Uh, in this case, pricing. So the decimals actually matter. Is that this, that's the thing that matter, right? But then we are like the design because um, in general that's how it is. We'll have it uh, aligned to the left. But if you are a user, actually, if you think about it, like having it aligned right makes it so that it's easier for you to compare the values for the decimals, and that's what you should, should do. Uh, and this. Actually, you won't actually know until you show it to the user or you think about it from the user's point of view. And sometimes, like even the UI or UX artists, like they may not like pick this up because it's such a minor detail. Uh, the other thing is like for anticipating of problems, um, always take care of your empty states. So a lot of times, like uh, because at my company, like we don't ha have all the uh, UI states like being designed, so sometimes we have to think on our own like what it looks like. So for instance, uh, let's say if there's no results, how do you actually uh, convince the user or like make the journey better for the user uh, by having giving them alternatives? So if let's say they are searching for a product or a brand, like uh, maybe you should you can show like other brands that are related to that thing they are looking for, or if, say, uh, let's say, they uh, in my in my company, like let's say they search for the correct thing, but then they misspell it, then actually it, like there's such a thing called elastic search, in which um, basically the typos are kind of uh, accounted for and. Um, they will be like shown results that um, may not be captured if it was like a, a more rigid search. So another point is like for mobile responsiveness. Uh, like I guess this one is a more of an interactive one. I want to kind of know what you think this like would be better for mobiles. Um, so I think y'all might have seen the top kind, which is like a hamburger menu. And then there's the uh, tab bar. Like, think about it yourself, right? In your head, which do you think is better for mobile? Okay, so you might have your answers. And, and I mean, there's no right or wrong answers. But if you follow a lot of the major companies, like in fact, a lot of uh, the in the earlier like tool. I can't remember by tool one four or so. Like they were still using the hamburger menu, and because that was like a trendy thing, yeah. and uh, people were just using it. But over time, they realized that it's actually not very usable for mobiles because what you have to do is um, they realize that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and it's a few more uh, button presses to get to where you want to get to. So you might want to, I don't know, post a photo or whatever. You press the hamburger menu and then you search for the thing that you want to search for and then it, it pops up the result that you want. Uh, so nowadays, if you look at a lot of your apps, uh, they kind of integrate a lot of it together, which is they have the tab bar, which, is, uh, which contains like the major stuff that uh, they, like maybe three or four of the major functions, and then the hamburger menu. And like iteratively, like all the big major companies come up with like the same kind of solution, 
because uh, like UI design is actually a lot about like what the user's uh, journey is like, and I think most humans um, probably act the same way. So there's like data backing this up, and you can actually take a look about it. Uh, it's quite fascinating. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I hope um, like you all get a sense of like what design is about, and if you are interested in learning more, there are other resources as well. Thank you.